Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as you hear the story I call, Death Writes a Letter. My story begins last summer in the townhouse of Martin Drake, a well-known financier. Martin is deep in argument with his older brother, John, as his daughter, Susan, enters the room unnoticed. John, how can you possibly believe in such things? Spiritualism, nonsense is a better word for it. To a skeptic, everything is nonsense. But if you'd seen and heard what I have, you too would believe. Hello, Father. Uncle John. Hello, Susan. Oh, I see you two are up to your old argument. Well, your father is a very stubborn man, Susan. <laughs> well, I may be stubborn, but I'm no fool. Imagine believing in spiritualism, telepathy, and all that Tommy rot. I believe in spiritualism, Martin, and that the living can communicate with the dead. And nothing you can say will swerve me from my beliefs. Uncle John, in all these years you've been studying spiritualism, have you ever been able to communicate with Aunt Judith? No, Susan, I haven't. But there have been times late at night when I've all but broken through the barrier that separates us. Oh, I give up. There's no use in arguing with a man who has an obsession. Oh, that's fine, Father. Now the three of us can go into supper. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan, but I can't stay for supper. Oh, why not? I have an appointment with an honorary critic. A what? An honorary critic, a man who's an interpreter of dreams. John, good grief, don't tell me you believe in that, too. Why not, Martin? For years, psychoanalysts have interpreted dreams in an effort to help their patients... The subconscious minds of the living can sometimes bridge the vast gap of death. Now, John, I'm warning you, if you don't give up this obsession of yours, there's no telling how you'll end. I know you think I'm cracked, that all the years I've spent studying spiritualism have been wasted, but you're wrong. The living and the dead can communicate with each other, and someday you'll realize I'm right. Now, I really must be going, or I'll be late. Well, Uncle John, you will drive up to the country with Father this weekend, won't you? Oh, are you opening the summer, please? Yes, I'm driving up tomorrow to open the house and engage in service. Well, I'll try my best to join your father this weekend. Oh, that's fine. Don't bother showing me the door. Good night. Good night, Uncle John. Good night. To think that anyone in this day and age still believes in spiritualism, particularly your Uncle John, it's incredible. I don't know, Father. Uncle John seems so sure of himself that... Sometimes I feel he may be right. Oh, Susan's a nonsense. But look, Father, if it's all nonsense, why should Uncle John believe in it? You yourself have often said he's the most brilliant man you know. And he is. It's just that, well, we all have our eccentricities and John's is spiritualism. Until his wife died five years ago, he was just as sane as you or I. No living person has ever communicated with the dead, and none ever will. Come in, dear. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry uh, if I woke you, Father. Oh, it's all right. What time is it? It's just 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock? Oh, what are you doing up and dressed so early? I'm driving up to the country to open our summer place. Have you forgotten, Father? Oh, yes, so you are. Oh, didn't you sleep well last night, Father? The circle's under your eyes. No, I spent a very poor night. I had a, a nightmare, but I can't seem to remember what it was about. Oh, I'm sorry, Father. Scully, is there anything I can get you? No, I'll be all right, dear. You run along. Oh, I need the keys to the car. Oh, yes, you'll find them over there on my desk. And uh, if you need any money, help yourself. Oh, thank you, Father, but I have enough money. Have you found the keys? Oh, yes, here they are. Oh, do you want me to mail this letter on your desk? What letter? Well, this one. It isn't addressed. All that's written on the envelope is one word. Urgent. Urgent? Yes, and it's in your handwriting, see? Why, I never wrote that. But, Father, it is your handwriting. Oh, and look, there are ink stains on your fingers. You must have written it before you went to bed. But I tell you, I didn't. Let me see that letter. Yes, that's my handwriting, all right. Oh, Father, I'm leaving now. I want to get there by noon. 
Uh, what? Oh, yes. Uh, goodbye, dear. Take care of yourself. I will, darling. Bye. Urgent. And it's my handwriting, all right. But for the life of me, I can't remember. Well, let's see. Dear Martin. What the devil? A letter in my own handwriting addressed to me. Dear Martin. No. No, this can't be. It can't. Martin, is anything wrong? I came as quickly as I could. You sounded so upset over the phone. Dr. Warren, I'm, I'm afraid my mind is giving way. You, Martin? You're the last person in the world to become unbalanced. Well, that's what I thought until I read this letter. Letter? Yes, and it's in my handwriting, so I must have written it. I'm afraid I don't understand. When I woke up an hour ago, this letter was on my desk. I could see it was my handwriting, and yet I don't remember having written it. You don't remember having written it? No, and yet I must have. There are still ink stains on my fingers. <laughs> Martin, none of this makes sense. Yes, I know. What's in the letter? I'll read it to you. Dear Martin... Uh, wait a minute. You mean it's in your handwriting, but, but it's addressed to you? Yes, but it's signed with the name of my brother, John. Signed by John, in your writing? Exactly. Y you better read me that letter. I, I, uh, maybe then I can understand this. Dear Martin, this letter will undoubtedly give you quite a shock. But, but after, after you, you finish reading, reading it, it I'm, I'm quite sure you'll understand why it was written. After I left Susan and you a few hours ago, I went to keep my appointment with the dream interpreter I'd spoken to you about. It was shortly before midnight that I returned to my home. As usual, I found Martha and Paul waiting up for me. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. John. Paul, Martha, what are you doing up so late? I told you never to wait up for me after ten o'clock. Well, we worry about you. You know what the doctor said about your heart. You should have been in bed an hour ago. You both treat me as though I were a six-year-old. And sometimes you act like one. Well, I have a glass of warm milk for you in the pantry. I don't want any milk. It's good for you. Here, let me have your coat. Oh, thank you, Paul. <sighs> it feels good to be home, sitting in the chair before the fire. Here's your warm milk, Mr. John. And I want you to drink it down without any arguments. After all, it's for your own good. Here, take Mr. John? Mr. John? Martha, what's wrong? Oh, oh. Mr. John, he... <laughs> Mr. John, Mr. John, answer me. He, he's dead. Oh. Oh. Now, please, Martha, please, you mustn't cry. The end came very quickly, peacefully. Not there, Martha, there. <laughs> It came as quite a shock, Martin, hearing myself declare dead. But as I saw my earthly body sitting in the armchair by the fireplace, I knew it was true. John Drake was dead. I wanted to comfort Paul and Martha, make them understand that only the body of John Drake was dead, that the spirit would live forever. I wanted to tell them that I was indescribably happy, for I knew without knowing how that on the following day I should be reunited with my dear wife, Judith. Then my thoughts turned to you, Martin. And in one brief moment, I saw your past, your present, and your future. Your future left me horrified, Martin, for in it I saw unhappiness. Unhappiness and death. I felt that somehow I had to warn you of what the future held. I left the house I had died in and went to your home. The radio was playing. You were sitting in an easy chair, reading a book, unaware of what the future held for you. Martin! Martin, you must listen to me. Martin, look up from that book you're reading. You must. But I couldn't reach you with my words. There was too great a distance between us. I stood by, helpless to aid you. A few minutes later, you yawned, closed the book, and turned off the radio. A half hour later, you were in bed and asleep. And then, then I suddenly had hope. I couldn't reach you while you were awake, Martin, but while you slept, 
Perhaps I could reach your subconscious, warn you about the future. I saw your desk with writing paper on it, and I knew that was the only way to reach you. I spoke softly, trying to reach your subconscious. Martin, Martin, listen to me. This is John. You must hear me, for it's a matter of life and death. You must do exactly as I say. I want you to get out of bed. That's it. Throw back the covers. Now put your feet on the floor. Martin, do as I say. That's right. Now go to your desk. That's fine. Now sit down. That's it. Pick up the pen that's on the desk. Martin, pick up the pen. That's right. You picked up the pen and began to write as I dictated. Everything up to this point explains how this letter was written. And now, the reason for it. In looking into the future, I was horrified to see that Susan would die the night of June 7th, 1947, at exactly six o'clock. That means you must act swiftly, Martin, for she has less than 24 hours to live. If you don't, she will be found frozen to death. As for yourself, I see you dying as the result of an accident in a small, roughly furnished room. In this room is a desk calendar, and the date it shows as you lie dying is September 3rd, 1947. Martin, Martin, the love love I bear bear you and your your daughter daughter has reached reached out from from another another world world to to warn warn you against against the future. I pray that you will act upon this information and save yourselves. Your brother, John. That's the most extraordinary letter I ever heard. Well, what do you make of it, Doctor? You sure this is your handwriting? I'm certain of it. And then there are these ink stains on my fingers. Yes. It's amazing. It's obvious that I wrote this letter last night in my sleep. What upsets me is the content of the letter. The things I wrote are so fantastic that I, I'm afraid I may be losing my mind. No. I'm quite sure you're sane, Martin. Well, then how do you account for my writing such a fantastic letter even in my sleep? Has it occurred to you that this fantastic letter, as you call it, may not be fantastic? What? Now, Henry, you're not trying to tell me that you believe that this letter is true. That my brother John did die last night and came here Surely you don't believe in all that, Tommy Rot. Then your explanation for that letter is that you wrote it while having a nightmare? Well, of course. What other answer could there be? It's ridiculous to think that you, a man of science, could attach any credence to this letter even for a moment. You amaze me. There have been many phenomena in history. Phenomena that never could be explained. Not even by science. Oh, you're almost as bad as my brother. Soon you'll be telling me that you, too, believe in spiritualism. Have you called up your brother this morning? Why, no. Why should I have? Oh, you think he may have died last night as he wrote me in this letter? (laughs) Doctor, I, I think you'd better see a doctor. I suggest you call your brother. Well, all right, I will, just to show you what a fool you are for believing even for a moment that there can be anything to this letter. Why, when John was here last night, he looked just as healthy as... Uh, uh, hello, uh, Paul, uh, this is Mr. Drake. Is my brother there? The what? Last night, after he returned home. I... I see. Uh, uh, thank you, Paul. He is dead, isn't he? Yes. Paul said that he died last night. If your brother died last night, then this letter must have been written by him through your subconscious after... after... No, 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 that can't be. What you're saying is madness. The dead can't communicate with the living. But in this letter, your brother speaks of his death last night and goes on to tell... My brother couldn't have written that letter through my subconscious. Such things can't happen. I wish I felt as certain as you do. What about this part of the letter? In looking into the future, I was horrified to see that Susan would die the night of June 7th, 1947, at exactly 6 o'clock in the evening. 
That means you must act swiftly, Martin, for she has less than 12 hours to live. If you don't, she'll be found frozen to death. And that proves how fantastic the whole letter is. Today is June 7th, and outside it's like summer. How could Susan possibly be frozen to death? I don't know, Martin. But if Susan were my daughter, I think I'd want to be with her tonight at 6 o'clock. You'd never be able to forgive yourself if anything were to happen to her. I'll go with you if you like. Oh, very well. But mind you, I still don't believe that John wrote this letter through my subconscious. What time is it, Henry? It's a few minutes after six. If we hadn't had the breakdown, we'd have been there hours ago. Uh, How much further is it? As soon as we reach the top of this hill, you'll be able to see it. I wish we'd reached the house before six. Now, surely you don't believe what that letter says. How could Susan possibly freeze to death? Why, it's a warm evening. It's like summer. Yes, I know, but just the same, I wish we'd arrived sooner. Look, you can see the house now, down there in the valley. Susan's probably getting dinner. And we'll certainly look like a pair of fools coming up here because of that ridiculous letter. I hope you're right. Henry, Susan isn't in her room. She isn't? No. Could she be in the village or a visiting friends? No, no, no. You're forgetting her car is parked in front of the house. Yeah, that's right. Well, where can she be? I'm afraid I can't answer that. I'll search the second and third floors while you search this floor in the cellar. She must be someplace in the house. Henry, where are you? Down in the cellar, Martin. I searched every room on the second and third floor, but I couldn't find a sign of her. I found her, Martin. You found her? Well, where is she? Susan. You must prepare yourself for a shock. Shock? Martin, listen to me. I found her in the cold storage room, frozen to death. No, no. She can't be dead. But she is, Martin. From what I could make out, she turned on the freezing system full and then went inside to store some meats, probably right after she got here. While she was in there, the door slammed shut and locked her in. Oh, Susan. If only I'd gotten here in time. Martin, for weeks now you've been like this. Now, you must get hold of yourself. You'll break down. You did everything you could to save Susan. No, no, that's just it. I didn't. John reached me from beyond the grave to warn me about the future, but I merely laughed. Had I heeded his letter, Susan would be alive today. But, Martin, you did try to get there in time. It wasn't your fault the car broke down. Yes, but if I'd believed in the letter, I'd have hired another car and kept going instead of waiting for my car to be repaired. You know, I've been thinking... Perhaps it was meant that your car should break down. That you should arrive too late to save Susan. What? Perhaps... It was wrong of John to break through the barrier that separates the living from the dead and warn you of the future. Well, how could it be wrong if it would have saved Susan? Perhaps it was ordained that Susan was to die when she did. And that's why the car broke down. No, 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 no. I could have saved her if only I'd hired another car and rushed on to my country home. But at least now I can heed John's warning and save my own life. Save your own life? Yes, Have you forgotten the other part of the letter? As for yourself, Martin, I see you dying as the result of an accident in a small, roughly furnished room. In this room is a desk calendar, and the date it shows as you lie dying is September 3rd, 1947. Today is August 1st. That means I have less than five weeks to live, unless I can save myself. But how can you save yourself, Martin? What's meant to be will be. Not if I'm clever enough to take advantage of the information in this letter. Dying as a result of an accident in a small, roughly furnished room. Yes, but if John had only told me what kind of an accident it was meant to be. Well, nevertheless, come what may, I'm not going to die on September 3rd. Just a minute. Hey, Martin, what, what's going on? I mean, what, what's the meaning of all those men around the house? Why, why was I searched before I entered the room? 
Henry, do you know what the date is? Well, yes, it's September 2nd. Yes, and in a few minutes it will be midnight, and then it will be September 3rd. Oh, yes, that's right. The letter. In the letter, John warns me that I shall die of an accident in a small, roughly furnished room. Well, you'd hardly call this drawing room that, would you? No, I wouldn't. It's my intention to remain in this room until, tom until tomorrow is past. Now, Henry, would you mind keeping me company for the next 24 hours? No, Martin, not at all. See, I've taken every possible precaution to prevent an accident from occurring. I've removed everything from this room but that sofa, chair, and table. And I have food in here to last me for several days. I have guards around this house and outside this room to prevent anyone from entering for the next 24 hours. It certainly sounds as though you've taken every precaution. Yes, I've... I've done everything I could think of. Henry, do you hear that? It's just midnight. September 3rd is here. <laughs> Martin, will you stop looking at your watch every other second? I can't help it. One more minute and it'll be midnight. And when the clock in the hallway strikes, it'll be September 4th. Yes, Martin, yes. Now, why don't you sit down and take it easy? How can I at a time like this? Martin, you must calm down. Think of your heart. Only 30 seconds more, Henry. 30 seconds. Martin, you're as white as a sheet. Well, who wouldn't be? I'm cheating death. I'm going to live. Live, do you hear? Easy there now. I can't help feeling it would have been better if John hadn't warned you about the future. No, no, don't say that. If he hadn't, I'd have been dead by now. That let... Henry, do you hear that? It's midnight. And I'm still alive. Alive. For some weeks, Martin Drake was a sick man as the result of the strain he'd undergone. But with the coming of fall, he was well on the road to recovery. It was in late autumn that he invited Dr. Warren to go hunting with him in Maine. Day after day, the two men, with their guide, roamed the woods. The exercise and outdoor life did Martin a world of good. And he was soon his former self, both physically and mentally. It seems to be getting much colder, doesn't it? Yes, it uh, feels very much like snow. I think it'll hold off for a while yet. Would you like to do a little more hunting, Mr. Drake? we still got a couple of hours till it gets dark. Yes, I wouldn't mind. How about you, Henry? Well, by all means. Maybe we'll come across that, that buck we spotted this morning. Yes, he was a big fellow. Uh, where'd I put my rifle? Uh, here it is, Mr. Drake, under the tree. Oh, yes, yeah, so it is. Here's your rifle, Doc. Right. Uh, this rifle of mine... Oh. Martin, what happened? Good grief, oh. he shot himself, Doc. Martin, are you badly hurt? The gun went off when I picked it up on my shoulder. Easy now. Well, I have a look at it. Oh. Is it bad, Doc? Oh. No, not bad. We must get him to a shelter and stop this bleeding. Uh, Ed Tolliver's place is about a quarter of a mile from here, Doc. All right, give me a hand. we got to get him there at once. Uh, now, put uh, him down gently uh, on the cot. Okay. Easy now. Uh, that's it. How is he, Doc? Think he'll pull through? Uh, of course he's... Just fainted from the pain and the loss of blood. Now, let's see. Mm, sure is a nasty wound. Yeah. Fortunately, the bullet went on through his shoulder. I won't have to probe for it. Oh. What are you going to do to him, Doc? Well, first I'll have Henry, to... Henry, uh, where, where am I? Now, just lie still, Martin. We brought you to this shack where I can fix you up. Oh, my shoulder hurts. It'll be all right now once I get the bullet wound cleaned up. Pete, put my yep. medical bag on this desk here. Open it, will you? Sure, Doc. Will you have to probe for the bullet? No. Fortunately, it went right through. All I have to do is clean the wound. It may hurt a bit, Martin. That's all right, Henry. Go ahead. Uh, maybe you'd better turn your face away from me so you won't see what I'm doing. Sometimes it's easier that way. Concentrate on the desk over there, huh? All right. Pete, hand me that tube of sulfur powder. Yep. Also the... Henry! What is it, Martin? That... Calendar. What calendar? There on the desk. Don't you see? Yes. Do you see what date it has? September 3rd. Well, I guess that's the day Ed Tolliver went back to the city. September 3rd. Oh, Martin, you mustn't get excited. Do you remember what the letter said? Henry, this is it. Oh, Martin, no. You'll be all right. If only you'll calm down. Not it. This room is small, roughly furnished. And the desk calendar does show September 3rd, 1947. Henry, it's all as John said it would be. I haven't cheated death. 
He's here in this room. He's come to take me. He's come to... Doc, what's wrong? He's dead. Dead? But it was only a shoulder wound. You said he'd pull through. Yes, but I was wrong. Shock killed him. I guess nothing can save a man when it's ordained he die. Death came to Martin Drake as it was foredoomed to come. Martin and Susan, wasn't it? Even John Drake's warning from another world couldn't save them. Which seems to prove that when your time comes, nothing you can do can change it. So you might as well not worry about it. So I did know of a man who managed to outwit death for several hundred years. Then one day he was... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's story, all the characters were fictional, and any resemblance to the name of an actual person, living or dead, was purely coincidental. In the cast were Maurice Tarplin, Roger DeCoven, Eric Dressler, and Bryna Rayburn. Original music was played by Paul Taubman. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Robert J. Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled Death is My Co Pilot. Another strange and suspenseful tale of the mysterious traveler. Your mysterious traveler has turned author. Yes, Maurice Toplin has penned a chilling tale titled Seven Casks of Death, which appears in the current issue of Dime Mystery Magazine, one of the popular publications group now on sale at your local newsstand. Don't miss it. This program has come to you from our New York studios. Another program of tense and dramatic action will follow in just a minute. Stay tuned to the station for Official Detective. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.